fighting each other in the process. Meanwhile, folks started moving out. Folks started thinking about moving out. Folks got kicked out. Folks ended out on the streets and sidewalks in record numbers because we couldn't get out of our own way. End of the day, society becomes how we behave. We are our behaviors. End of the day, you know, got no one else to blame but ourselves. It happened on our watch, our watch, all of this. And I say that to make this point that we all have to reconcile that. We need to all be a little bit more accountable to this crisis of affordability. And I think what makes today a special day is this is a big moment as we begin in the spirit of all the comments that were made to take responsibility, not to give the same speech and expect the same applause, but to begin to do something about it. And these sets of bills, there's 38 bills I'm signing today. I'm just going to spare you 36 I'll do privately. I'll, I'll focus on the two big ones that unite us all here at the podium. But this is a big package. These bills matter. They go across the spectrum, not just what we've talked about, but it goes to issues of ADUs, goes to the issue of farm worker housing, goes to the issue, Ben, thank you, of transparency and accountability. Accountability. Because the biggest issue now we have is not the issues that are being resolved today as it relates to land use and CEQA and streamlining and prevailing wage and skilled and trained and all the related issues, including, thank you, Assemblywoman, financing and state support, $14 billion just in the last two years, specifically for state support of affordable housing. It's now about results. And that's where I go back with my mayoral hat on. I've said it a hundred different times in a hundred different ways. You know, localism's determinative. That the state vision will be realized at the local level. Cities and communities all across this state. And that's where we need to see results. That's where we need to see accountability. We need to see them drivers. We got the tools now. And, and I, I don't say that as a warning. I, I say that sternly, um, directionally. You know, ask the folks down in Huntington Beach. Ask the folks here in San Francisco. <laughs> that letter that HCD sent. You know, it, it's not because we, we don't love you. It's because we love you. <laughs> and you're going to see more of that until we see more housing. More production, more folks working, you know, growth and inclusion. And I think that's a, a mantra. Prevailing wage, skilled and trade, that's about inclusion. We've, you know, focused so often about growth, we've forgotten this part of it. And so I, I, I love to be part of this. I want this photo. <laughs> you know, Jay, congratulations, man. It's uh, amazing what the Carpenters were able to do. Andrew and Abstentia and the trades, thank you. My brother Larry, it's good to see you as always. Um, it's good to see us all up here. Remarkable leadership by Buffy Wicks. Remarkable leadership by Buffy Wicks. Uh, she never took no for an answer. <laughs> Ever. Senator Caballero, I mean, I, Another remarkable leader who's, you know, we were just at the podium and big round of applause for Wendy. <laughs> for Senator Caballero, I'm going to talk about Wendy. Uh, thank you as well. I mean, for driving this path and creating a pathway. And I, I appreciate both of you recognizing uh, Senator Atkins and recognizing Speaker Rendon because they create the conditions that create the pathways to make this possible. To all your colleagues, it's amazing. I, how many of you showed up? <laughs> By the way, bipartisan group of folks, That's right. mm -hmm. which is remarkable as well. And I'm grateful for each and every one of you taking the time to be here. You all belong here and you all come up here in a moment when we sign these bills. Uh, look, we're producing some results and, and now we need to see them manifested. And, uh, and I, I just want to, again, express gratitude in closing, not just for this, 
But I hope folks have paid a little attention to what's been going on in this state in the last few months. You know, it was a week ago we signed a package of bills, and I'm going to, and this gets to Senator McGuire, who's just been appropriately recognized for being the rock star that he is. We last week had the opportunity to sign an unprecedented package of climate bills. And I love that we talked in terms of that integration here today as it relates to housing, jobs, linkage, as it relates to climate and climate and housing, all these policies being interrelated. But that package was foundational and determinative in terms of setting a new tone and tenor in terms of California's leadership. This package on housing, the work we've done together on homelessness, I know, I know you want to see the results of that. But this legislature, what they've done, what they've accomplished, there's no legislature in this country like the California legislature. And I mean that. These folks get it, but here's the difference. They get it done. I have the privilege of working with them, and I cannot impress upon you more how proud I am for their example and their faith and devotion to this cause we hold dear, and that's California. And so I say that as a point of pride, not as governor, but as a guy who lives here. Uh, that I'll put these folks up against any legislature in the United States of America. Our legislature deserves a big round of applause collectively for all they've done this year. I mean it. I mean it. So, you know, to all of you, thank you. Um, I'm not going to take any more time. You're all exhausted and we're out of time. Uh, but I do want to ask the members of the legislature to come on up because we've got to make room for them. Uh, Senator Weiner, notably included. Hey, Jay, you get, get, get up here, man. Like, stop talking, you get up here. Get up, Larry, get up here. Get up. Danny, you good? David, SCIU, get in here. Come on, David. Scott better be up here. Scott, get up here, man. Got to get in. IBW. Yay, uh, we're right by you. <laughs> Hello. 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 Congratulations. Uh, can we? I know. I, I, know. I, know. Sorry, no. it's still, no, I it's, know. You can never say sorry enough. All right, let's do a big <laughs> smile first. All right. Legislature, please look at it. All right, these are the actual bills, so let me sign them, but I'm going to hand them to someone before we lose them. Um, yeah, don't lose them, please. Yeah. Which one is this? 2011. All right. Woo! SB6. Yeah. Well done, everybody. Now, everybody's here to answer questions, if you have any. Great job. Hi, Dustin Gardner from the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, Governor, several of the bills you signed deal with carve-outs to CEQA. You've spoken several times in recent months about wanting to see broad reform to CEQA because it is hampering various projects throughout the state. What type of broader reform would you like to see, and how would you get it done? Well, I think we're, we're advancing reforms here today, land use reforms, ministerial as of right zoning. That's exactly what we've been calling for. This is a demonstrable example of what we've been talking about, including the 19 or so CEQA bills that I've had the privilege of signing where we work together in terms of zoning opportunities for affordable housing, 100 percent affordable housing around transit, focus on issues related to homelessness and critical housing around our home key and room key programs. Uh, this is the kind of progress we're making, and this is the kind of example of things we want to continue to see going forward. And building on that question, are those specific types of carve-outs that are designated for specific projects that meet strict tri strict criteria, is that enough, or do you want any sort of broader CEQA reform? Hey, look, I, I think we're making pro – I'm going to focus on the progress. This is a big deal today. I, I do not want anyone to believe or even to suggest this isn't a breakthrough in housing in this state. I think, you know, four or five years ago, about a year or two prior I got here, I appreciate the leadership, Pro Tem Atkins and others were 
really out there with Senator Weiner and Governor Brown. We started to see some real progress. There was some momentum in the last few years, but today is a punctuation point. And so I, I think this kind of progress and also the sense of purposefulness in terms of the collaborative spirit that defines this moment, I also think will create some momentum going forward and I want to see continued progress. Governor Greg Lee from KTV, you talked about localism and accountability. HCD is investigating San Francisco's processing of <laughs> permits. Uh, yeah. Homeless leaders sued the city today regarding the building of affordable housing. Uh, what is your comment to the city of San Francisco and other jurisdictions that you may find some opposition build housing. <laughs> Just build housing. It's not even that complicated. It's, you know, Econ 101. Build more housing. Stop talking about it. You know, enough processing. Be inclusive. Be responsible. Be respective of community and, and those you serve. But move and disabuse yourselves so we can continue down this pace that we've seen in the past. It's not that complicated. At the end of the day, it's leadership. And we now have created yet another opportunity and set aside another, you know, well, they're running out of excuses. I guess that's a better way of putting it. From money, land use, CEQA, at what point then now does that accountability need to be advanced and I think we've demonstrated now the state has demonstrated that we can lift the veil of those excuses and we can focus where we need to focus and that's going local hey governor thanks for talking to us Jeremy White with Politico uh, so the deal around these bills such as it was was essentially to send you two bills with different approaches in terms of the labor standards which depending who you ask are either needed or may make it more difficult to build some housing is the goal here to advance both approaches, the skilled and trained, the prevailing wage approach, and sort of see which one works and which one could then be the model going forward? Well, there are 38 bills, so I, there's not just two bills. I signed two today, but the 38 bills, so uh, it depends on which bill we're referring to. As it relates to different approaches, it relates to commercial and strip malls, it relates to the senator's bill, that's a certain, you know, particular strategy and approach compared to more of these smaller one-off uh, approaches that will be part uh, of 2011. So I think they're different uh, in context uh, that they also are tracking different strategies to solve different problems uh, based upon different land use strategies and different uh, components of the housing crisis and the opportunities that this commercial shift uh, in the macroeconomic shift provides and presents itself. So I don't, I don't want to see it in those old binaries. Uh, I see this uh, as complimentary. Thanks, Governor. Uh, and then on the topic of labor, uh, there's probably no bill that we as reporters are asked more about these days than the farm worker unionization bill. Yep. I understand you're not going to tell me whether you're going to sign or veto well, it here. That's why we can ask another question. But given that you <laughs> expressed some concerns about it, I want to give you an opportunity to go into what some of those uh, concerns are. I appreciate are the opportunity, the and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you've afforded that on multiple occasions. I've got, I think, 400 bills that are waiting for me. Yes. And uh, <laughs> trust me, <laughs> What I want to do is escape their lobbying and by sneaking out as quickly as I can. Uh, but I got 400 bills on my desk and I've got uh, less than 72 hours. Um, and so we'll be working on that among many other bills in the, the next, uh, uh, well, when I get back to Sacramento. Hi, Governor. Ashley Zavala with KCRA 3. Yeah. In 2018, voters will remember you made a campaign promise of 3.5 million new cool. units of housing by 2025. <laughs> We know there's been challenges, the pandemic, you mentioned local challenges that the state has seen in uh, making that possible. I think we're at 120,000 new units now that permits were issued for by your administration at this point. Um, it, one, I, are there any other challenges that you can point to, to um, sorry, uh, that you can point to that made this goal really difficult? And also, do you have a renewed goal uh, should voters choose you this upcoming well, election? This is a thank you for the opportunity. I, I've had this privilege on a few dozen occasions, and I'll, I'll take advantage of it yet again. And I don't mean that pejoratively. I mean that honestly. Uh, when I announced that goal, I didn't make a promise. I said this is the goal that will solve the housing crisis. It wasn't a number that I pulled out of the thin air. It was a number that McKinsey had done on the basis of a, an analysis of many different housing uh, studies. And that was the number that I said at the time was the number that actually will solve the problem. We could put out a number that won't solve the problem, or we could put out a number that would solve the problem. I said it was a stretch goal. 
Um, and I made the point at the time uh, that it's a goal that in the process of trying to achieve it will allow us to see what's possible. Uh, I also said that we would codify that goal more uh, formally through a process called the RENA process. And we just went through what we referred to, forgive the language, the six cycle RENA. And we put a legal framework forward of 2.5 million units, this goes to the latter part of your question, uh, that we want to secure by 2030. And that's roughly, uh, it's a complicated process, but roughly the numeric. Uh, you reference 120,000 units, let me reference a more specific number. Within the first six months of this year, we're on pace of uh, breaking the number of permits for housing, uh, largest number since 2006. We're at 71,236 uh, permits that have been afforded uh, in the first six months of this year. We still have more work to do, but I'm enthusiastic about that. You're correct about the macroeconomic issues, the supply chain issues, the issues of the headwinds associated with the last 24 months, and I appreciate uh, that recognition. But we're just winding up, and I'm very enthusiastic. And I think, uh, and I'll close, Michelangelo said it better than any of us. Uh, the biggest risk in life, however one defines risk, is not that we aim too high and miss it, it's that we aim too low and reach it. It was always a stretch goal, and we intend to continue to have audacious goals because Californians deserve them. Thank you. And And then an off-topic one for you. Uh, this is our first time interacting, journalists from California, with you since um, a couple Fridays ago. You tweeted uh, that you would like to debate Governor uh, Ron DeSantis on CNN. Were you serious yeah. about that? Well, uh, of course I am, but tough time to bring that up. Uh, and let me just express deep empathy and respect for the challenges that uh, the governor's facing. Of course, all Floridians are facing. We've offered uh, support. Um, and uh, they know that when they need it, it will be there for them. Uh, and uh, we're committed, not just in terms of addressing the urgency of the moment, uh, but the aftermath uh, in terms of the recovery, something in California we know all too well. Uh, we are here for our fellow Americans. We're there uh, and will always be there uh, for Floridians and for Governor DeSantis. Joe Garofoli, San Francisco Chronicle. How are you doing, Governor? Uh, I want to talk about something you signed yesterday, a piece of ground, some groundbreaking legislation on that would uh, transform California into being an, a national haven for those seeking abortion. Oh, yeah. um, but there are no requirements that California find out, determine how many people are coming from out of state. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you do that with, while still respecting patient privacy, provider privacy, and yet, at the same time, determining whether the programs you've created with $200 million of uh, money uh, are working and whether taxpayers and patients and providers are getting what they need. Well, that's a, I mean, it's, that's a deeper conversation, one that's difficult in this kind of environment to, to respond to as comprehensively and appropriately as you'd like. The $200 million is additional resources on top of the historic baseline. No other state in the country doing more for reproductive rights, reproductive women, uh, uh, reproductive freedom than the state of California. We're proud of that, and everybody up here is accountably responsible for that and has delivered in remarkable ways. I'm proud of the package of bills we passed yesterday. I'm proud of the fact that we have the backs of those that are seeking their reproductive rights here in California in a way that will preserve and protect them from prosecution against attorney generals like Paxton and others uh, in states like uh, Texas uh, that seek to criminalize uh, the aiding and abetting of individuals that leave those states to get their reproductive rights uh, in a state like California. And so I'm proud of those protections. I'm proud of the legislative effort. Uh, we just signed the bills, and there's a process of application and implementation. Uh, but we also have a group of remarkable leaders. We call it the FAB group, it quite literally is FAB uh, group, uh, which is all about accountability, all about making sure those dollars are well resourced uh, and invested. Uh, and I think therein lies a framework as it relates to the accountability frame of your question uh, that we would look to their example and their guidance as it relates to making sure those dollars are going where they were intended and the accountability is being secured at the local level. 